inflation is picking up, the unemployment rate is coming down. That isn't stagflation. That's classic, strong growth, demand pull inflation that also makes the labor market tight. We have to, we have to forecast the Fed, not accept going with the Fed forecast. Most of the time it's wrong. We uh, uh, thought, always thought the Fed would raise rates more than they thought. 네, 전 세계의 현명한 투자자들을 찾아서 그들의 의견을 들어보고 또 그들로부터 어, 지혜와 인사이트를 얻는 대한민국 유일의 글로벌 소통 인터뷰 <웃음> 참프로 t v 의 글로벌 머니터 오늘도 시작하겠습니다. 오늘도 중앙일보의 강남규 팀장님과 함께합니다. 어서 오십시오. 안녕하세요. 네. 근데 유일은 맞아요? 없습니다. 저희 말고는. 아, 레귤러하게 하는 경우는 사실은 음. 지속적으로 하고 있는 데는 드물죠. 네. 뭐한번 하는 거는 누구나 하죠. 아, 그렇죠. 네. 지금 예. 현재 1년 음. 넘었습니다. 예. 넘어가고 제가 있습니다. 태어난 지 이제 50년 가까이 되어 가고 있는데 예. 뭐 하나 이렇게 진득하게 한게 처음입니다. 그렇죠. 노랑머리 전문가를 1년에 2주에 음. 한 번씩 그 음. 불러낸 경우는 드물 것 같습니다. 쉽지 않습니다. 예. 음. 여러분이 뭐 당연히 인정해 주실 거라고 믿고요. 예. 어, 감사합니다. 인정 받고 싶습니다. 네. 뭐, <웃음> 오늘은 오늘은 앨런 사이나이를 인터뷰하셨네요. 네, 미국의 음. 그 디시전 이코노믹스 이른바 이제 경기 예측을 시장과 음. 경기 예측을 해주고 돈을 버는 회사입니다. 음. 어, 외국에는 곧잘 있습니다. 분, 경기 분석을 해주 해주는 회사도 많고요. 네. 어, 경기 주가를 예측해 주는 회사도 많습니다. 그런데 아마 이 디시전 이코노믹스 앨런 사이나이 대표는 어, 미국의 뭐 월스트리트 저널이라든지 월가의 이카나미스들이 가장 인정하는 음. 그 가장 정확하게 예측하는 경제 전문가로 어, 인정하는 음. 음, 사람 가운데 한 명이죠. 그 경제 예측으로 출연료를 받는 게 아니라 그쵸. 경제 예측으로 돈을 예측비를 버는. 받는 그렇죠. 음. 알겠습니다. 이분은 향후 경제를 어떻게 생각하는지 한번 들어보겠습니다. 요즘 미국 경제가 요동하고 있죠. 네. 그리고 주가도 요동하고 있고요. 음. 이런 때에 이분을 우리 3% 글로벌 머니 톡이 음. 처음 인터뷰한 건 아닙니다. 지난해 네, 상반기에 예, 예. 지난해 상반기에 인터뷰를 했습니다. 음. 그때에 미국의 그 전미 경제 연구소가 음. 어, 경기 판단을 하기 이전인데도 어, 팬데믹 침체는 미국의 역사상 어, 그때 당시 정확하게는 아마 2차 세계대전이 가장 짧은 침체가 될 것이다 라고 음. 선언을 했습니다. 어, 그 이런 과감한 예측을 했는데 몇달 뒤에 네. 그 전미경제연구소 MBER의 경기판단위원회 비즈니스 사이클 커미티에서 음. 어, 2000, 어, 2021년 3월에 아, 2월 말에 시작한 침체가 단 서너 달 사이에 끝났다라고 음, 네. 판정을 했죠. 음. 사실은 그런 측면에서 보면 은 아마 경기 예측을 해주는 대가로 왜 돈을 앨런 사이나이 박사가 돈을 버는지 가늠해 볼수 있을 것 같습니다. 음. 자 오늘도 한번 그런 질문을 던져보죠. 사실은 요즘 연준이 통화 정책을 긴축적으로 잡, 방향을 잡았는데 네. 우리의 고민은 긴축은 하면서 경기는 추락하면 어쩌, 어떡하냐. 그게 가장 걱정이잖아요. 예. 긴축을 하는 것까지는 이해도 되고 납득도 되는데 어, 경기가 꺾이면서 긴축이 될까 봐 그게 가장 걱정스러운 것이라서 앨런 사이나이 박사의 경기 예측을 좀 얼른 들어보고 싶네요. 바로 인터뷰 진행할까요? 어, 예. 네. 어, 대표님 어떻습니까? 지금 미국 경제가 가장 사실은 단순하게 여쭤보겠습니다. 지금 현재 미국 경제가 미국 경기가 도대체 어디에 서 있습니까? Uh, the U.S. economy is in uh, expansion. I would call it a boomy expansion. The economy is very, very strong. Uh, in 2022 and 23, it's going to continue that way. And uh, real GDP growth, real GDP growth, we're thinking will be in the four and a half percent range. That is unprecedented fiscal stimulus. Mm -hmm. uh, the household sector is in good shape. Uh, the unemployment rate is coming down fast. A uh, lot of jobs being created, a lot of people finding work, wage inflation is rising, uh, and uh, the business sector is uh, filled with cash t going to spend money. Uh, it's the dynamics of the business cycle. We are in a very powerful expansion in the U.S. Yeah, with this really strong economy, 4.5% growth 
2022 and we think three and a half percent in 2023 and the potential output growth in the 2% range, that's a lot of demand coal inflation stimulus. And so, uh, yeah, inflation is going to stay high. Uh, it, 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 this, this past year, it was about uh, 6%. Uh, that's a real upward burst of inflation uh, from an economy that grew almost 6% in 2021. So it's classic demand pull inflation. And there is because of the COVID a restraint from the labor side and that is pumping up costs and inflation as well. But mainly it's a powerfully growing economy with a lot of monetary and fiscal stimulus. Price inflation goes up. We think it will subside into the three to four range. That's a good deal higher than the Federal Reserve thinks. We think it will. It's a worry because in a lot of history, price inflation will spill into wage inflation. If the labor market's tight, wage inflation as a cost goes into price inflation, price inflation goes back into wage inflation, and you do get a spiral. So that is a 10, 15% risk that we're watching, but we reject it. We think inflation will subside, but it's going to be high by uh, the standards of the last two decades in the three to four percent range. Stagflation, the unemployment rate is 4.2 percent as we speak. In June, it was 5.9 percent. That's a big decline in the unemployment rate. And since June, we've had a big increase in inflation. Inflation is picking up, the unemployment rate is coming down. That isn't stagflation. That's classic strong growth, demand pull, inflation that also makes the labor market tight. 우리가 일반적으로 알다시피 비즈니스 사이클 경기는 어, 저점에서 회복 그 다음에 이분파를 넘어서 네. 확장 그 다음에 정점에 이른 다음에 다시 이제 하락 국면에 들어가는 들어가지 않습니까? 그런데 사이나이 박사는 놀라울 정도로 확장세에 들어가 있다. 지금 올해도 한 2022년에도 한 4.5% 내년에도 3%대 3% 중반대에 네. 경제 성장을 할 것으로 예상을 합니다. 음. 사실 여기서 잠시 우리 그 3% 글로벌 모니터 청취자분 시청자분들에게 알려드릴 것은 사이나이 박사는 일반적으로 낙관주의자로 분류가 됩니다. 음. 그걸 감안하시고 들으시면 도움이 되실 것 같습니다. 예. 네, 조금 전에 물가를 언급 하셨는데요. 어, 박사님께서는 이걸 일반적으로 교과서에 나오는 수요 견인 인플레이션으로 보십니까? 아니면 공급망의 문제가 생겨서 발생한 공급 측면의 인플레이션으로 보십니까? In, in the 70s, uh, between 1973 and 1975, crude oil prices quadrupled. And then in 1979-80, they doubled. Uh, so quadrupling is a 400% increase. Now, crude oil prices uh, doubled in the last year. But why did crude oil prices go way up? Uh, it, it went way up because the U.S. economy bounced up off the depression of the pandemic and grew 6%. So all commodity prices go up, oil prices go up, and oil prices go up pulled up mainly by overall strong demand, people spending money, driving, traveling, uh, when, when we weren't sitting around because of the COVID. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we do have, because of, I think of so much demand pressure, supply can't keep up. You, you remember, the US economy hasn't grown at 6%, 5.8% last year for decades. Uh, when any economy grows at that pace, and if there's some supply disruptions, tight labor markets because of the disease, COVID, uh, you're gonna get uh, costs going up and you get glitches in the provision of goods, especially in a world where uh, the US buys from everywhere. You, it, it, all of our goods are bought in a globalized way. So production chains stretch all over the world and all over the world, the disease was hitting. So we have not just demand pull inflation, but we have a supply side crunch as well. 
to give us this very high inflation. But I think mainly it's demand pull. Mainly it's demand pull. The supply side glitches, uh, economies and people in them will kind of work their way around it. Those should ease over the year. But the demand pull pressure on prices and wages in the United States uh, it probably won't, won't ease off that much because we're so strong. We're growing so strongly and we are going to grow so strong. Are we growing so strongly? Oh. We're, we're, we're growing. Okay. We're growing so strongly because we have massive monetary and fiscal mm -hmm. stimulus. And why do we have that? Because the disease knocked us out and the policymakers didn't know it at the time, but I think they overdid it. But they had to do it because the economy shut down. Same is true in lots of countries in the world. Korea is doing stimulus now uh, to recover. And uh, probably the Korean economy will surprise you on the upside. And you're going to have you're going to have some higher inflation in Korea than you thought, because what does the central government have to do when you get a natural disaster like a pandemic that crunches the economy? It has to keep it going and you can't calibrate that. So in the United States, we overdid it. And that's part of why we have so much inflation. 그 음. 사실 뭐 경제 현상에서 우리가 무자르듯이 음. 아 이것은 어 수요 견인이다 아니면 공급 푸시다라고 네. 얘기를 말할 수는 없습니다만은 사이나이 박사는 음. 이 팬데믹의 억눌린 소비와 그다음에 강제 저축 때문에 늘어난 수요 음. 이 수요가 급증하는 바람에 음. 어그 글로벌 공급 에러도 발생하고 있고 그다음에 물가도 오르고 있다는 쪽입니다. 그래서 사실 수요 견인 쪽에 더 무게를, 더 무게를, 두시고, 무게를 두고 설명하시네요. 이건 인플레의 원인을 설명하는 일반적인 미디어의 시각과는 거리가 좀 있는. 그렇죠. 네, 그러니까 항상 미디어들은 이제 헷갈렸던 건데 네. 왜 공급망에 문제가 생긴 탓으로 나타난 인플레이션을 금리 인상으로 잡느냐. 사이나이 박사의 표현을 빌린다면 이렇게 말을 하네. 그 지난해 이제 연 6% 정도 성장을 미국 경제가 성장을 했는데 네. 그 정도 성장하는 데에서 글로벌 공급망에 음. 팬데믹 때문에 위축돼 있는 글로벌 공급망에 에러가 발생하지 않으면 에러가 네. 발생하자면 그 이상한 거 아닌가? 음, 라고 말씀하시는데요. 음, 강한 사실, 수요가 이미 있다. 아 그렇죠. 그럼 그 수요의 원인을 좀 여쭤봐야 될것 같습니다. 대표님 어, 수요 때문이라고 말씀을 하셨는데 아니 팬데믹 때문에 사실은 경기가 위축되고 많은 사람들이 일자를 잃고 그랬습니다. 그런데 수요가 그렇게 급증했다는 것에 대해서 탄, 수요가 탄탄하다는 것에 대해서 이해가 가지 않습니다. 왜 음. 그럴까요 대표님. That's a great question. A whole bunch of stuff. I think remember when When we shut down, we totally shut down. The economy plummeted. Uh, and then uh, after the first wave and beyond that, we opened. Something we economists call pent-up demands. The household sector, consumers in aggregate in the U.S. economy, 70% of the U.S. economy. Consumption spending totally shut down, went negative. So when we reopened, There were a lot of pent up demands for all kinds of goods, travel, services. Then we had another wave of COVID. We didn't shut down, but we slowed down. Then we came back. Well, we have these huge pent up demands. And at the same time, households, since they didn't spend, they saved whatever money they were earning. So savings went way up. And then the federal government poured fiscal stimulus in to the household sector in the form of transfers, another source of funds. So the household sector, 70% of the economy, got very liquid. The saving rate went into the 14% range. And when we came out of the downturn, consumer spending unleashed. Uh, you know, we had the same thing happen after World War II, because we had a wartime economy. World War II ended, consumer spending boomed. All those demands were suppressed. That was one reason. Second, of course, was the interest rates being taken to zero and quantitative easing by our Federal Reserve, which poured funds into the mortgage and treasury market, kept long-term rates down. And so uh, in real terms, long-term rates were negative, as they've been in mo most of the world. And that's very stimulating, plus the funds that were put in the system. 
And then we had the fiscal stimulus uh, under Trump and with Biden. And when you add up the five programs uh, up to now, it's $7 trillion of stimulus from the central government. And you can't find any time in American history that so much government money funds were pumped into the economy. So of course the private sector will spend it, will save some of it, uh, but it's a huge amount of federal government stimulus we're a $24 trillion economy. So seven trillion is uh, 25 to 30% in increased deficit spending fully accommodated by the Federal Reserve with very low interest rates. The most stimulative possible fiscal policy we could have. There is no way to calibrate how much upward st stimulus is coming into the economy because we've never seen it before, this big. But what you do know is it's not gonna knock our economy down at this point, it's gonna raise our economy. So uh, we, we are thinking as we look to this year and next year with the fiscal stimulus that's out there existing, percolating in the system uh, with the latest infrastructure spending program that was passed by Congress about a trillion dollars that will come in in 2022 via the state and local government sector that will get these funds and spend it on uh, roads, highways, buildings, broadband, uh, some of the internet. That's all of this is why we see this growth rate for the US economy uh, and next year too, that it's the strongest growth that we've seen in the US in, in decades. The U.S. is not used to it. The world isn't used to it. And the inflation that has come with it is out of sync with the low inflation we've had for a long time. But it's the way of the world, all this stuff, and the dynamics of what goes on inside the business cycle. Consumers spend money. Companies hire people. People get paid. Prices go up. Workers ask for more money. Costs go up. Businesses raise prices to cover costs on the margins. Uh, it's a just a, a boomy expansion. And it will help the whole world. The, the whole world economy will be helped by it because we, we buy a lot from everybody. Well, Sinai 박사는 어, 강제 저축. 네. 그러니까 사실 중간 소득층 가운데서 가장 큰 지출이 여행입니다. 음. 근데 미국인들의 여행이 확 줄었죠. 특히 해외 여행이 못 가죠. 어, 예. 음. 그 덕분에 늘어난 그저 강제 저축. 예. 음. 그리고 이제 주가 주식 투자 및 자산 투자 소득도 꽤 많이 늘었고요. 네. 여기에다 미국의 그 연방 정부가 뿌린 수표가 있습니다. 경기 부양 차원에서. 음. 네. 예. 그리고 미국 연준이 페드가 뿌린 양적 완화도 있고요. 음. 물론 양적 완화가 곧바로 중간소득층의 주머니를 두둑하게 해준 건 아닙니다만 네. 기본적으로 이제 자산소득을 늘릴 수 있는 배경이 된 거죠. 그렇게 해서 늘어난 소득. 음. 사실 제가 이 사이나이 박사는 말씀 안 하셨는데 제가 확인한 데이터로는 OECD 특히 그 산업화된 국가 선진국가의 그 초과 저축 중간 소득층 이상의 초과 저축이 네. 4조 달러 정도 된다라고 얘기를 해요. 많이 늘었죠. 예. 많이 늘었고 많이 늘어난 그 체크가 주식이나 뭐 부동산으로 바뀌었을 테니까 예. 그에 따른 평가액 증가분까지 파워하면 꽤 늘었겠죠. 그렇죠. 예. 음. 사실 그 4조 달러가 이제 앞으로 어떻게 풀리느냐 음. 그거에 따라서. 그 음. 어떤 뭐랄까 경제 성장률 그 다음에 경기 변동이 달라질 수 있고 그에 따르는 통화 정책도 달라질 수 있다라고 네. 예측하는 그 전문가들도 꽤 있더라고요. 음. 음. 미국 경기에 대한 질문 좀 이어가 보죠. 음. 박사님 그러면 미국 경기는 지금 매우 좋다 그리고 그것은 그 강한 수요 때문이라고 진단을 해주셨는데 언제쯤 그러면 고점을 찍고 침체로 접어들 걸로 예상하십니까? The the deficits and the central government debt. They go with those deficits. Uh, uh, it takes time, but as interest rates rise, debt service goes up and takes a bigger uh, portion of the federal government budget 
And then it's hard for the federal government to spend money on, on other activities. But that takes time. We're not at that stage yet. Uh, we did not, at least at this point, we have not added another trillion and a half or two to the, to the deficit with the Build Back Better program. Uh, it's got a lot of things in it the U.S. needs societally, but we don't need that much stimulus. It would be too much. So it's better that we don't do it. But um, depending on the election, the midterm elections, if we do another trillion and a half dollars on top of seven, then the deficits that go with it and the debt, because you get more debt when you're financing with deficits and rising interest rates and interest charges on the federal budget will come back and cause trouble in the dollar. This is a, probably a few years away. If, if this were to happen, trouble in the dollar, the US economy will have a problem then and the expansion will not go on. Uh, you know, you know uh, business cycle expansions and this one uh, began, the one we're in now began in April. We had a two month depression. It's amazing. And the business cycle we bounced up and tremendous volatility because of the disease and the policies, but it, it's, it's a business cycle. I've seen it many times. And uh, in the, they, they last typically uh, modern era five to seven years. So uh, we're already just about two years into this one. April, 2020, it began. We're January, 2022, uh, two years. So there's probably a few years to go. And the way the uh, expansions get into trouble, they turn into a boom, you get a lot of inflation. The central bank wakes up one day and says, oh, we got too much inflation, we have to fight it. Then they raise interest rates a lot. Funding is shut off. Uh, the stock market weakens. Asset prices don't rise. The unemployment rate begins to rise. People get more pessimistic and you get a slowdown in growth or a recession. And with that process a few years from now, yeah, the binging of today, because it is, I told you, 7 trillion out of 24 trillion, there's nothing like it in American history. So how can I tell you and forecast something? I can do it and I'm, I'm doing it when nothing like it's ever happened before. You know, uh, it's kind of flying, not by the seat of one's pants, but it's flying blind. I, I gotta be honest about it as a forecaster and tell you, I haven't seen it, but it's upside in growth, potential upside on inflation, and certainly a lot of deficits and debt. Interest rates for sure are on the rise. Today, for example, the 10-year yield went up 12 basis points. Uh, the Federal Reserve is gonna keep raising rates for the duration of this expansion, that's a few years, at least. The rates will go up, interest charges on federal government debt will go up, and the debt is so large that those interest charges are going to make it tough later on for the federal government to spend, and that'll be part of the next downturn. 역시 낙관주의자답게 음. 사이나이 박사는 음. 그 침체가 뭐 경기라는 건 영원히 갈수 없으니까. 예. 근데 침체가 어 내년 하반기 이후에나 음. 어 찾아올 수도 있다라고 음. 아주 유보적으로 조심스럽게 예측하시네요. 예. 물가는 계속 오를 것이고 경제 성장률도 탄탄할 것이고. 예. 그로 인한 통화 긴축도 있을 것이고. 예. 음 내년 여름 지날 때까지는 계속 될것 같다 이렇게. 그렇죠. 실물 경제의 흐름은 음. 내년까지도 얼추 탄탄하다고 봐도 큰 지장이 없을 것 같습니다. 음, 일단 뭐 사이나이 박사의 의견입니다. 네. 안녕하십니까 강원국입니다. 아, 요즘 장이 굉장히 어렵잖아요. 네, 그래서 요즘에는 많이 버는 것보다는 어떻게 덜 잃느냐 아니면 잃지 않는가 이런 거를 공부하는 것이 훨씬 더 중요하다고 봅니다. 아, 물론 돈도 벌기는 벌어야죠. 이 전략들을 따르면 은 장기적으로 복리 10에서 15% 정도는 버실 수 있을 겁니다. 저는 이 강의에서 집중적으로 자산 배분과 마켓 타이밍을 다룰 겁니다. 그거를 어떻게 글로벌 ETF를 통해서 할수 있는지 바로 실전에 적용할 수 있도록 어떤 ETF를 어떤 이유로 언제 사고 언제 파는지도 같이 알려드릴 겁니다. 이 전략을 요 직접 ETF를 사고 파시면서 
직접 구현하실 수도 있는데요. 네, 그거 말고도 자동 매매를 할수 있는 방법도 있습니다. 그래서 제가 자동 매매 이용권을 같이 드리고요. 네, 그리고 제가 거인의 포트폴리오의 저자 아닙니까? 그 책도 같이 드립니다. 그러면 그걸 하시다 보면 은아 이거 굉장히 재밌다. 나도 나만의 전략을 만들고 싶어 하실 수가 있거든요. 그런 분들을 위해서 백테스트 이용권도 같이 선물로 드립니다. 퀀트 투자라고 하면 은 그거부터 벌써 아 이거 굉장히 어려운 것 같아 라고 생각하시는 분들이 굉장히 많은데요. 제 강의를 보시면 은 이게 하나도 어려운 게 아니라는 것을 알수 있습니다. 제가 정말 아주 명확하게 처음부터 기초부터 잡아드리고 특히 직장인들한테 가성비가 가장 높은 투자라는 것을 아실 수 있게 되실 겁니다. 네, 강원국이 여러분의 성공 투자를 기원합니다. 예! Yeah! Sir, I have a different question. The most important thing is the Goyong Jipyo. The Goyong Jipyo is very tight. In the case of the Goyong Jipyo, it is very difficult to find out. The background is the fact that the employees are making a great resignation. It is found in the sense of the present. How do you think about this question? The labor market in the United States is very tight and getting tighter. Uh, I think, too, is Korea, too, in a lot of countries, the unemployment rates are low despite the disease. Uh, we're going to be short workers in country after country, uh, and workers are going to be happy. They'll be happy because they'll have money, they'll have jobs, they'll have choices, particularly uh, those who are, are being trained for what I call the new economy. The new economy is a technologically centric economy and not a labor centric economy. It's the kind of thing that makes this interview go on. It's the Zoom, it's the destructive technology companies, uh, the Amazons all over the place, all over the world. They're all over in Asia. And people need to be techni technically equipped to, to deal with it. And we oldsters like me probably are not. But as people retrain and get trained, uh, they'll find plenty of jobs at, at good pay. Uh, I'm very optimistic about the labor market. People talk about the missing Workers, all the people are not back to work yet. Yeah, there are about 3 million of those in the United States two, two years after the collapse. Uh, but look at all the people who have gone back to work in the last five months. It's over 2 million people on the household survey have found jobs. Uh, now they may be low paying jobs, but they're working, they're getting paid. Uh, they, they're happy. America is unhappy because our politics are terrible. Washington fights all the time. And I think that's the main reason why America is unhappy. And I think Americans are not confident about the future. I mean, look, this horrible COVID is around. In Washington, uh, they're fighting like mad, nothing like the old days. Uh, we do have uh, tensions uh, in uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, geopolitical tensions. We have tension and competition with China. Uh, and uh, uh, the Middle East. Uh, so uh, I think Americans are uncomfortable, but even if it isn't, we're at 4.2% unemployment rate. We were 3.5 before the pandemic hit. We're almost back to what was considered to be full employment. And in a lot of our business cycle episodes, when we got close to 4%, that was full employment. People are now leaving jobs, finding new ones, and uh, getting multiple job offers, the dynamics of the labor market are very strong. And so uh, I don't think Americans are discouraged or there's a great resignation because of, of that. I think it's, you know, are you going to get COVID tomorrow? Uh, every day out of Washington comes another fight. They can't agree on anything. Uh, and uh, Ordinary people, workers, and households actually are finding more work at better pay now. Uh, and this is only January 2022. Deputy, Jerome Powell, Mig Fed, Ujangi, Mutarina Kijungum, Ulilka, 보기에 올해 몇 차례 올릴 것 같습니까? We're more hawkish than the Fed is. We have them 
raising rates four times, and it may be more, four times. The, uh, the tapering they've now told us uh, will end in March. 어, 박사님, 잠깐만요. 어, Fed 내부자들은 대체로 올해 세 차례 인상을 예상하고 있습니다. 그런데 박사님은 네 차례 인상을 아주 그 단호하게 예측을 하셨는데 그 배경이 궁금합니다. I'm talking about this year, four times, 2022. Well, we have to, we have to forecast the Fed, and not accept what the Fed tells us. Uh, and so, I, I would uh, humbly remind people uh, that over decades, uh, you make more money by betting that the Fed will be wrong and change their mind than by going with the Fed forecast. Most of the time, it's wrong, and so. Uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a systematic reason. I, some other time I'll tell you the analysis of why it's bound to be, they're bound to be late and most forecasts are wrong anyway. And so uh, the, the Fed does forecasts every quarter and more often, but they really don't do it for a living every minute, every day, every hour. And even those of us who do it that way, it's hard. And so they sit down and they do a lot of judgment forecasts. They hear a lot of stuff and they just kind of go with it. Plus that those projections they show us after the second year, they are projecting achieving the goals of the Fed, price stability and full employment. If the last forecast for 2024, the numbers there represented the achieving of the goals. Well, they hardly ever achieve the goals. So they're fictitious. So you can only look at the next year or two. Now, on our forecast, which is stronger growth than the consensus, stronger growth than the Fed has for this year, inflation not spiraling, but staying high. It's not transitory. It's permanently higher compared with before in the three to four range. And the unemployment rate later this year, lower than three and a half, which is what it was in February, 2020. On that forecast, if it, roughly that happens, the Federal Reserve will have to raise rates sooner than what they said after their last meeting. And we are saying that May, a quarter point, uh, one in uh, uh, June or probably July, meeting in July, another in September, another in December, four quarter point hikes that will take the federal funds rate to a percentage point. That raising rates by the Federal Reserve spills over into the long treasury market, along with a, a very strong economy, inflation expectations going up because inflation's up uh, and a lot of borrowing. And so the 10 year yield we are forecasting about two and a half percent, we're at 1.6. We went up 75 basis points last year and we're forecasting 90 basis points, a smaller percentage increase uh, than, uh, than, uh, ne than next year. So, so uh, that sounds high, but if inflation is in the three to 4% range, it's negative in real rate terms. So we don't think that'll stop the economy, but that's, a hawkish forecast compared to what the Federal Reserve says. And we've had that forecast. Uh, we've had close to that. Um, because inflation has run higher, about 6%, we were forecasting four. The Fed was forecasting two, we were forecasting four. Because the economy is so strong, uh, we uh, uh, thought, always thought the Fed would raise rates more than they thought. And they are. <laughs> they told us a few weeks ago they're going to raise rates more than they thought before, but they're not going to raise rates, they think now, as many times as we think they will. We have four rate hikes in 2023. They have three, and we have two in 2024, because there we think the economy will weaken. That is 10 times a quarter point, it's two and a half points. Uh, that'll be a federal funds rate that won't be what's called the terminal rate. And if inflation is running three, it'll still be negative in real terms. 
uh, the long bond rate that goes with that would be about 4%. So when you say 4% for the 10 year yield, two and a half years from now, people are shocked. When's the last time we saw a 4% 10 year bond yield? Well, in the seventies, they were in double digits and the economy still grew. So, you know, uh, 4%, at least the older people will earn some money on their savings. Finally, after all these years of getting nothing, there are pluses. I, a 4% in a, an economy, uh, it, it, that is not enough to throw us into a recession. It would take a lot higher rates to do that, plus a crunch in the funds flows going into the uh, economy. But it's a different world. The world for markets is interest rates on average are going up. We think the equity bull market continues. And you see that in almost every business cycle. Uh, earlier stages, interest rates go up because the economy is strong and they're in a sense pulled up. Uh, and the uh, equity bull market continues because the economy is strong and earnings are strong. Earnings. Earnings drive the equity market. 사이나이 음. 박사께서 여러 가지 길게 설명을 하셨는데 음. 제일 그이이 이, 이 대목에서 인상 깊은 말은 페드가 예측한 것은 역사적으로 많이 틀렸다. 음. 그러니까 인플레이션도 일시적인 현상이라고 봤는데 지금 현재로 음. 봐서는 일시적인 현상은 아닌 걸로 보이죠. 음. 이런 것처럼 그러면서 투자자들이 주목해야 될 대목을 어, 넌즈시 귀뜸했습니다. 바로 페드가 어, 태도를 바꿀 것이라는데. 입장을 바꿀 것이라는데 배팅하면 은 돈을 벌었다는 역, 과거 역사적 실, 사례를 좀 강조를 네. 하셨는데 예. 이 대목을 좀 의미심장하게 기억해 주시면 좋겠습니다. <웃음> 예. 네. 박사님 그렇다면 그렇다면 요즘 미국 주가가 많이 타락하고 있는데요. 인터뷰하는 시점은 어, 1월, 1월 중순경입니다만 어떻게 보십니까? 미국 주가에 대해서 앞으로 좀 전망을 해 보신다면? 야, 이 거산. It goes on. It, we're uh, we're thinking uh, S and P 500 uh, end of year 5300. Uh, that's about a 10% uh, increase. Uh, that's a very good year by most standards of history, but nothing like what we've had the last three years. Uh, and you know the la last two years have really been uh, after the collapse, the tremendous upward move of the economy, and the incredible performance of company earnings. Company earnings are growing. They're out of sync with the growth in nominal GDP. Something's going on. Uh, American companies, and I think companies all over the world, are learning how to do really well on earnings. I think it's technology, because technology lowers costs. Um, it helps demand because it allows people to buy more widely from all over the world. Uh, tremendous amount of costs are saved because people don't have to go out and shop. They buy online, they get things delivered. And you have uh, innovations uh, coming from technology, uh, which are cost saving and labor saving. And company after company installs technology, gets rid of people puts stuff out on the cloud, like their human resources function, saves a lot of money on costs. And those companies that go out on the cloud and provide the services and the, the items that used to be done in a company, they can grow very strongly because they're small and you get a very dynamic result. Technology feeds that. So uh, I'm a big believer that the uh, technology uh, revolution of this episode is also uh, without uh, history. It's uh, commonly called disruptive technology that came from a Harvard business professor, He's the late uh, uh, Chris, uh, Chris uh, Christensen. Christensen was his name, uh, a, a business school guy, but he, um, he got us all paying attention to uh, disruptive technology. It's, it's going on all over the world. Mm -hmm. Th this conversation is an example of it. Oh, uh, the okay. speech I'm going to give, in, well, the speech I'm going to give in Seoul on January 27th, I won't be there. It'll be this way. Do you know how much money that saves them and us, the Institute for Global Economics and us? Plus, I don't travel to. I, I mean, I miss it. I'd love. I'd rather go uh, to Seoul and Tokyo. 
I won't have all the meetings I normally would have. But that's four days, five days. That costs 25,000 bucks. And how much does this cost? Or how much okay. will it cost, cost the Institute for Global Economics? I'll mm -hmm. keep them in business for another year because they don't have to pay me very much because I'm not incurring a lot of costs. I just have to show up and look, you know, look as good as I can look <laughs> on, the, on, the, uh, on the visual. 뭐 참, 떨떨 뭉친 낙관론자. 아 그렇죠. 네. 올해 연말에 음. S&P 500 지수 기준으로 <웃음> 네. 5,300. 음. 어떻게 이 정도 되면 2% 어, 들어가고 싶지 않습니까? 어 그러니까 최근에 이 급락이라는 게 그냥 뭐 심리적인 조정이라는 거죠. 그냥 특별한 어떤 원인을 찾기도 그렇고 음. 펀더멘털의 변화도 없으며. 다만 이제 계속 연준이 긴축을 하는 것 때문에 생기는 이른바 발작인데. 모르겠습니다. 그렇죠. 긴축을 하더라도 계속 유동성이 공급이 될 거라는 뜻인지 아무튼 꽤 높은 이미, 이미 풀린 돈을 음. 걷어들인 데도 상당한 시간이 걸릴 것이기 때문에 음. 유동성이 증가하지는 증가하지는 않더라도 줄어드는 속도가 더딜 것으로 본다 음. 그런 의미인 것 같습니다 사실 네. 어, 근데 굉장히 낙관적인 말씀을 해주셔서 사실 그 귀도 솔깃합니다 근데 음. 대표님 지금 그 어, 부자 아빠, 가난 아빠, 저자, 로버트 기오사키 등 투자 이른바 투자 구루로 불리는 분들이 사상 최악의 주가 폭락 내지는 슈퍼 버블이 뭐 부풀어 올랐고 음. 곧 파열할 수 있다는 경고를 하는 투자 구루들이 좀 있습니다. 어, 대표님이 오시기에 올해 미국 증시를 둘러싼 가장 큰 리스크는 무엇이라고 생각합니까? Yeah, fundamentally, it would be too high inflation, not just in the United States, but other countries. And central banks then would have to change their plans and raise interest rates more because, uh, depending on the country, uh, too much inflation is a bad thing. Now, central bankers around the world haven't had, for, for the most part, haven't had to face that issue for a long time. So for the U.S., for example, we had too little inflation. So Chair Powell and colleagues changed the whole thing and went to what I call post emptying rather than pre emptying Let the inflation roll uh, because it's too low. We got to average 2%, that's our goal. And now what do we have? We have 6%. So uh, I think uh, that's the, the big problem and the, the potential risk, the biggest fundamental economic risk. There are other risks. Uh, we're bound to have a, a, a correction of size in the stock market at some point. That's 10, 15%, maybe 20%. I, I think that comes for fundamental reasons. We might get too much inflation. The Federal Reserve raises interest rates faster and markets sell off a lot. Uh, we could get some hesitation and growth in the economy, but the economy's growth and earnings growth look very solid for the reasons that I mentioned before. Lots of policy stimulus, the internal dynamics of the economy and the way companies manage their bottom line. It's really extraordinary how well they do in managing the bottom line. So I think it would, that's the fundamental one. And too much inflation getting out of hand and central bank response. A second would be geopolitical. Uh, Putin invades Ukraine. Uh, the US fights back. We go to a quasi wartime footing. It's a, some sort of, that would be, could be a correction. Uh, stock market will watch that for a while, but if it goes on and escalates, be a correction. We run into these things from time to time. North Korea, anytime, from the point of view of the United States, uh, we think the guy who runs it is, is mad, you know? And so who knows what he'll do? Uh, he looked pretty good in the last picture I saw. He's got a new haircut. Looks like he's done a little Botoxing of his face. So he now looks a little, you know, like the man of the world, as opposed to, it's good to see that. And then you have China and really a, Uh, what is a fundamentally long run competitive uh, race for two capitalistic countries? In my view, they're both capitalistic, uh, but one is run from the center and the other is run from inside. It's, it, we're a meritocracy and that's an autocracy. And uh, which one wins? They're huge. China's second largest economy in the world. The U.S. is the largest. But they're huge. And there is, there is a competitive Uh, war going on. Hopefully it doesn't turn into a, a real fighting war, but you don't know. So that's the, the geopolitical risk. And then you have politics. In the United States, 
uh, ex-president Trump runs again, wins. Uh, if that happens, I'm probably going to go live somewhere else. 사이나이 박사 같은 경우는 어떤 경제 내적인 요인보다도 음. 우크라이나 사태, 네. 그 다음에 중국과 음. 미국의 갈등, 그런 지정학적인 갈등을 사실, 변수로 보는 거예요. 예, 변수로 예. 보고 있는 듯합니다. 사실 음. 이카나미스트에게 이런 지정학적인 변수는 전형적인 외부 요인이죠. 네, 음, 그렇지만 않다면 사람들 음. 주머니에 있는 돈이 서로 왔다 갔다 하면서 잘 도는 거 말고 뭐가 남아 있겠느냐. 그렇죠. 음, 심리적인 쇼크만 아니라면. 충분히 경제가 활성화될 만한 유동성은 풀려 있으니 예, 그것을 예측하면 되겠다라는 게 결론인 것 같습니다. 예. 사실 혹시... 주가가 많이 내리지만 않았으면 이런 판단에 대해서 음. 뭐 당연한 예측을 하고 있는 거 아닌가? 라는 생각도 들었을 <웃음> 수도 있는데 주가가 그쵸? 막 이렇게 롤러코스터를 타고 난 다음이라서 특히 1월 달 주가 이야, 아, 왜 이렇게 1월 그 효과, 그 효과 제니어 네. 이펙트는 없는 것 같아요? <웃음> 이렇게 와도 되는 건가? 하는 생각을 예. 하면서 자꾸 좀 캐물었던 면이 없는 게 없지 않습니다. 어땠어요 이 프로 음... 낙관주의자의 이 영원한 그러니까 주, 이 주식판에서 승, 최후의 승자는 낙관주의자라고 얘기를 하는데 그렇긴 한데 네. 그렇죠. 낙관을 해야 사실은 주식을 살수 있는 음. 것이겠죠. 어, 모르겠습니다. 항상 이런 그 플럭츄에이션이 오고 나면 시간이 지나고 나면 항상 그것은 이제 회복하고 난 후라서 음, 큰 일은 없었습니다만 그 항상 닥친 상황에서는 음. 괴롭죠. 괴롭기도 그렇죠. 괴롭고. 음. 근데 이럴 때마다 어떤 저희 직업병인데 경제 기자들은 인터뷰 기사를 쓰면서 네. 독자들이나 아니면 시청자들 음. 늘 구독자들이 저 기자의 의견인 줄 알아요. 음. <웃음> 근데 사실 어 인터뷰의 어떤 뭐랄까 의견을 전달하는 음 컨베이어 벨트로서의 기자 네. 그다음에 진행자라는 음. 어, 것을 사실은 다시 한번 말씀드리고 싶고요. 네. 사실 개인적으로 저한테 의견을 묻는다라면 그렇게 비관적이질 필요는 없을 것 같다. 음. 저도 그렇게 사실 사이나이 박사의 어, 과거에 저는 굉장히 비관론자였고 위기를 굉장히, 굉장히 우려하는 사람 중에 네. 한 명이었는데 예. 요즘 와가지고 지금 현재는 그렇게 비관론적일 필요가 있을까 시장에 너무 과민반응하고 있다는 생각이 들, 얼핏 들더라고 이건 음. 저의 아주 사적인 의견입니다. 사실. 네, 그동안 유동성의 힘으로 계속 밸류에이션이 높아지다 보니까 예. 시장은 언제 흔들려도 흔들릴 수 있을 만한 불안감이 있었겠죠. 네. 네. 그러나 경기 그 자체는 특별하게 큰 이상 신호를 보일 만한 상황은 아니다라는 네. 아, 경제 위기는 금융권 예. 내에서 일반적으로 큰 음. 금, 금융 위기는 네. 그 다음에 경제 위기는 실물의 영역에서 아. 뭔가 누적이 됐을 때 발생하는 그렇긴 거거든요. 그렇긴 하죠. 그런데 문제는 네. 그동안 유례 없이 유동성을 풀어놓은 상태에서 그동안 왜 이렇게 많이 올랐냐는 질문에 대해서도 실적이 좋고 펀더멘탈이라기보다는 유동성에 따른 멀티플의 증가 이런 거 아니었겠습니까? 아 그렇죠. 그러다 보니 그 유동성의 변화가 생기는 결과로 주가가 떨어지는 걸 네. 아니 경기가 나쁘지 않은데 왜 주가가 내리겠습니까? 라고 세, 뭐 설명한다면 그것도 이제 4차원의 설명이 되는 거죠. 그래서 유동성 때문에 올랐던 주가가 유동성 때문에 떨어지는 것은 경기가 어떨 것 같습니까? 라는 질문을 해서 그 질문에 대한 바, 답을 어느 쪽으로 받든 뭐큰 인과관계가 존재하지는 않은 아, 예. 의미심장한 의미심장한 네. 참 의미 있는 음. 말씀이네요 예. 예. 그래서 시장은 또 시장들의 논리는 있는 것 같습니다만 혹시 경기에 다른 문제가 없느냐 네. 즉 연준이 이렇게 긴축을 하는 데 있어서 리세션이 오지 않겠느냐 하는 질문에 대해서는 충분한 소신 있는 답이 됐던 것 같습니다 이렇게 네. 인터뷰가 유익합니다 저희가 <웃음> <웃음> 그렇죠. 네. 연초에 사실 음. 그 연초에 가장 많은 그러니까 미국의 경제 기자들과 음. 비즈니스 리더들, 기업의 CEO들이 가장 자주 전화를 연초면 전화를 하는 음. 사람이 앨런 사이나이 박사거든요. 네. 예. 여러분에게 오늘 3%의 TV, 3% TV를 통해서 음. 그 미국 CEO들이 1월 달이면 예. 가장 통화하고 싶어져 싶어하는 전문가 가운데 한 명과 한 명의 의견을 여러분에게 전화, 전해드렸습니다. 네, 오늘 인터뷰 여기서 마무리하죠. 네. 예. 어, 사이나이 박사 어, 올해도 참 감사합니다. 내년 1월에도 네. 다시 한번 인터뷰를 요청하겠습니다. 네. Anytime. Good night. Bye bye. 네. See you in January. 네. <웃음> Every January. <웃음>